On a fateful night, on July 4th, 1980, deep within the heart of the Soviet Union, an eerie silence settled over the desolate train station in Kursk. The train, departing from the city of Harakov and bound for Moscow, pulled into the station. A routine police inspection was performed on each carriage, but the officers were completely unaware of the horrors that awaited them. One carriage stood apart, its doors sealed as if hiding a dark secret. The officers, compelled by duty, forced the door open, and the ghastly sight that greeted them shook them all to their very core. The walls and floors of carriage number seven were drenched in blood. It was clear that some depraved acts had transpired. Panic set in, and the horrified passengers who were gathered nearby fled in terror, their screams echoing through the desolate station. As the night wore on, a grisly discovery was made miles away, near the train tracks. The lifeless bodies of four females were found, discarded like mere objects. What had happened in carriage number seven began to unravel, and a serial killer was on the loose. Before we start, if you find this video fascinating, then at the end, please drop it a like and let me know what you thought about the case. It helps the channel. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe for more. Thank you. Among the myriad of maniacs that terrorized the Soviet era, Anatoly Nagyev stands out as one of the most extraordinary. He was brazen and unpredictable in his actions, wielding an almost superhuman strength that enabled him to shatter handcuffs with ease. The fact that this maniac eluded capture for so long can only be put down to his outstanding look. But, as with all things, even Nagiev's sinister fortune had its limits. Ultimately, the monster met his well-deserved fate, bringing an end to the chilling reign of terror that had gripped the hearts of the innocent. Born on January 26, 1958, in Angarst, Urkast region, Anatoly Guznovic Nagyev had a Dagestani father and a Kazakh mother. At the tender age of five, his family relocated to Vinitsia, a village in the Kursk region. It was there that his parents' relationship disintegrated leaving his mother to fend for herself and her three children. Nagiev's childhood was marked by difficulties. His father had little affection for him, complaining about his dishonesty and his obsession for fighting with kids in the street. Uninterested in education, Nagiev turned to violence to settle disputes, struggling to handle her son's unruly behavior his mother sent him to a boarding school, which he repeatedly fled. In the midst of his troubled youth, Nagiev found solace in sports, particularly weightlifting and gymnastics. This physical prowess allowed him to dominate in fights, even against adult adversaries. For Nagiev, sports represented more than an escape from his harsh reality. He harbored dreams of becoming a renowned circus artist. He wanted to be celebrated and well paid. With his striking looks and impressive build, Nagiev had the potential to achieve his ambitions. If not for the destructive tendencies that had taken hold of him by his adulthood. From an early age, Nagiev took an interest in girls and sought their attention. However, Despite his athletic build and handsome features, he struggled to appeal to the opposite sex. Nagiev attributed his lack of popularity to his relatively short stature. He was just 5 foot 5, which often made him the target of ridicule. As he faced rejection after rejection from girls, 
he developed a deep-seated hatred for the entire gender. Beneath his bitterness and insecurity, Nagiev had a knack for winning people over and seamlessly integrated himself into various social circles. It was hard to imagine such a charismatic and polite individual harboring such malicious intent, a quality he would later leverage to perpetrate his appalling crimes. At 17, Nagiev crossed the line into criminality. He assaulted a school laboratory assistant who had spurned his advances. The incident, which occurred in May 1975, only came to light years later, as the victim was too intimidated by Nagiev to report him to the authorities. Emboldened by his perceived invincibility, Nagiev assaulted another woman, who also kept it silent. This fervour reinforced his sense of impunity and spurred him on to commit even more crimes. However, his third victim proved to be not so willing to let him get away. He attacked his former classmate and she defied his threats and reported him. As a result, Nagiev was sentenced to six years in a penal colony. He was sent to a correctional facility in the Komi Republic, where fellow inmates attempted to assert their dominance over him on his very first day. But Nagiev's physical strength and agility enabled him to fight back. Viciously, he staged a brutal counter-attack, and following this altercation, Nagiev earned the nickname Mad and was largely left alone by his fellow prisoners. Despite his aggressive nature, Nagiev managed to be courteous with prison staff and consistently followed their directions. Consequently, after serving just four years, he was relocated to a workers' settlement in Shikishino village as a reward for his good behaviour. There, he was granted a measure of freedom. In 1979, while still serving his term, Nagiev unexpectedly became enamoured with Alla Borisanova Pugacheva, an ascending musical sensation. He was determined to gain her admiration by any means, even if it required force. His infatuation with Pugacheva spiralled into an obsession, which ultimately influenced the selection of his first murder victim. Nagiev claimed his first life when he was still serving time for his earlier crimes. The murder transpired on January 30th, 1979, in Pechora, a city situated 29 miles away from Shikshino. Occasionally, Inmates from the settlement were allowed to visit the city on weekends for shopping trips. At the Pechora railway station, Nagiev's gaze fell upon a woman who uncannily resembled Pugacheva. Using his deceptive charm, he approached her and extended an invitation to go to his house, but she rejected his advances and the psychopath's fury was ignited. He had a kitchen knife and he mercilessly stabbed her more than 30 times before desecrating her lifeless body by forcing himself on her and disappearing into the shadows. Haunted by his grisly deed, Nagiev was gripped with fear, constantly awaiting the hand of justice to seize him. But as the months went by, without any repercussions, his anxiety waned. In May 1979, he struck again, his deadly obsession once more intertwining with the railway. To journey from Shikshino to Peshora, Nagiev bribed the conductor with a small fee to secure his passage. He was placed in a compartment with a female traveller, an accountant en route to Peshora for a very important meeting. In Nagiev's twisted mind, she looked like Pugacheva, so he brazenly proposed intimacy on the train. 
only to be met with scornful rejection. She mocked him, and this unleashed the beast within him. Overcome by rage, he stabbed her twice and strangled her with a handkerchief. After that, he performed deviant acts on the body, again forcing himself on it, and this time, he removed gold earrings and gold rings from the corpse. Having hid the woman's remains in a storage space beneath the bottom shelf, Nagiev casually relocated to the next carriage, continuing his journey to Pechora. The body was discovered only two hours after the train's arrival, whilst cleaning the carriage. Although the conductor suspected Nagiev, he kept quiet, fearing the repercussions of his own negligence. Forensic experts were able to connect the crimes on both the trains, as the perpetrator left similar evidence on both victims, including bodily fluids. However, with no further leads, the investigation went cold, and it was just filed as another unsolved murder. Unperturbed, Nagiev continued to serve his sentence in the settlement, and in November 1979, he was released on parole. Once free, Nagiev returned to his childhood home in Vinista and secured a job as a projectionist. His work required him to travel among villages in the Kirkst region, organizing film screenings at community clubs. This free lifestyle proved ideal for the now unstoppable predator. Nagiev targeted women, subjecting them to violence but sparing their lives. Subsequent investigations revealed that during his 10 month tenor as a projectionist, Nagiev forced himself and assaulted a minimum of 30 women. There are even claims that his sister fell prey to his heinous acts. Nevertheless, the assailant never forgot about his obsession, Ala Pugacheva. In 1980, he was determined to find her in the capital. Boarding a train to Moscow, again, he didn't have a ticket and he fabricated a story to the conductor, saying he was visiting his mother who was terminally ill. With the carriage almost empty, the conductor agreed to let him ride in exchange for a small fee. Upon closer inspection of the conductor, Nagiev noticed her uncanny resemblance to Pugachev. This sealed her fate, when she quite rightly, rudely refused his proposition for intimacy. He lost control. Again, he pulled out a hunting knife and stabbed her. As the horrific scene unfolded, a second female conductor entered the compartment, and Nagiev delivered several fatal blows to her as well. He left the lifeless bodies in the conductor's compartment, and he started to check the other carriages, ensuring that no one had witnessed the gruesome acts. In one compartment, he discovered two women, whom which he swiftly stabbed, as they were bleeding to death. He forced himself on them. Such a horrific murder. At the end of the train, the serial killer stumbled upon the train crew's electrician, but decided to spare him. The electrician was in shock when the blood-soaked maniac appeared in his carriage. However, the killer uttered, I slaughter women like chickens, but I don't harm men, and left carefully shutting the door behind him. The electrician locked himself in, trembling with fear for the next hour, dreading the possibility that the murderer might change his mind and return to finish him off. Nagiev's cold, calculating focus turned from the electrician back to his lifeless victims, methodically stripping them of any valuable jewelry. One by one, he dragged each body to the vestibule, throwing them from the train as it travelled at high speed across the country. Once his gruesome task was complete, Nagiev slipped away at the next station, leaving the terror-stricken electrician 
to be discovered by new passengers boarding the train in Kursk. Investigators initially attempted to pin the macabre murders on the trembling electrician, going so far as to stain his boots with blood to bolster their case. But their hastily constructed theory soon crumbled. The train foreman had spotted the uninvited passenger and provided an accurate description. Undaunted, Nagiev journeyed to the capital, intent on executing his twisted plan involving Pugacheva. Some accounts suggest that the cold-blooded maniac infiltrated the singer's dressing room, masquerading as a passionate admirer with a bouquet of roses in hand. Yet Pugachev's constant entourage of devoted fans and colleagues proved to be her saving grace as they inadvertently thwarted Nagiev's sinister plans. Nagiev eventually traced Pugacheva's residence and audaciously infiltrated the building. His malevolent intentions were foiled by an alert concierge who started interrogating him and threatened to involve the police. In a panic, Nagiev escaped. After spending some more time in the capital, he concluded it was best to keep a low profile and return to Venista. Back at his home, Nagiev cunningly concealed the stolen treasures and gifted a diamond ring to a friend. What he didn't know was that the authorities had distributed descriptions of the pilfered jewellery to all the pawn shops and jewellers in the area, hoping to ensnare the murderer should he attempt to sell his ill-gotten gains. The friend, unable to remove the ring Nagiev gave him, sought help from a local jeweller named Nikishin. Upon examining the ring, Nikishin quickly realised that it was a female ring and it matched the description of one of the stolen pieces. Devising a plan, the shrewd jeweller asked his client to return in half an hour whilst he discreetly informed the police. In no time, the man was apprehended and identified as 25-year-old Grigory Dugin, a resident of Kursk. Under interrogation, he divulged everything, claiming he had received the ring from Nagiev just two days earlier and mentioned Nagiev's sudden affluence. Authorities rushed to search Nagiev's residence, only to find it virtually empty. The killer had already vanished. Investigators encountered only his mother, who revealed that her son had left for Naprepetrovsk to visit a friend. The pursuit of the elusive murderer shifted to the city of Dnieper. A critical lead was discovered in one of Nagiev's notebooks, which not only contained the address of his romantic interest, but also Ala Pugachev's address, accompanied by a vile and obscene curse next to it. On September 12, 1980, Nagiev was apprehended in Naprepetrovsk. The cold-blooded killer adamantly denied his guilt and was placed in a high-pressure cell. People are placed in high-pressure cells when officers are certain that they have their man and they want to break them. However, his cellmates were oblivious to the dangerous nature of the man they were confronting. In an attempt to intimidate Nagiev, one of them ended up losing an eye and another person was almost disabled. Nagiev again asserted dominance in this cell. As the investigation proceeded, Nagiev was held in the pre-trial detention center in Orel, from where he made his first escape attempt. After overpowering the guards, he then ripped open his handcuffs and shattered a window and leaped onto the street below. Unfortunately for him though, he landed on a chess table where the detention center employees spent their leisure time. This caused injuries to his back and he was unable to move. Following medical treatment, he was returned to his cell. 
Nagiev soon made another escape attempt. Using a broken spoon, he stabbed himself in the stomach. He was taken to hospital, where he planned to escape. However, the hospital staff vigilantly monitored the relentless maniac, foiling his plan to flee. The trial of the serial killer took place in the summer of 1981. During the proceedings, Nagiev brazenly feigned insanity, but the judges remained unswayed and sentenced him to death. The execution was scheduled to take place in the infamous Novoshevkask prison, where some of the most notorious killers from the Rostov Triangle had met their end. However, Nagiev escaped whilst being transported to the court. This happened at a train station, and in a daring move, he slipped past a freight train to evade his captors. The head of the Kursk Police Department's Criminal Investigation Division issued an unofficial order and quote, If it comes to it, don't take this beast alive. He's already been sentenced to death. If fortune favours someone, let them carry out the execution. Investigating the connections of the runaway killer, operatives tracked down Nagiev's girlfriend, who resided on the Yanovo farm in the Rostov region. With an air of finality, the murderous saga of Anatoly Nagiev drew to a close. There, amid a haystack, the operatives closed in on their target. During the arrest, Nagiev attempted to retaliate with a sawed-off shotgun, but was hit by several bullets and ultimately captured. Astonishingly, doctors managed to save the maniac's life, but merely to face the ultimate punishment. On October 28th, 1981, the bloodthirsty Anatoly Nagiev, at only 23 years of age, met his end, executed by a firing squad. In the end, the pursuit of Anatoly Nagiev, the elusive murderer, led authorities on a harrowing manhunt. His twisted infatuation with Ala Pugacheva marked a gruesome trail that spanned from his hometown to various cities in the region. Nagiev's reign of terror left a permanent scar on the lives of his victims and their families ultimately culminating in a dark case of obsession, murder and justice. Nagiev's gruesome acts will forever haunt the memories of those who crossed his path. That's the end of this episode. Until next time, stay sane.